Before we head in for the market outlook this week, just some updates on the applied level August 25th. We are getting closer to that. We're August 11th now, so two more weeks. Uh, will be the last day for new positions uh, in the market outlook. Then it will move uh, to the portfolio construction uh, module. September 9th, this is week one for financial modeling. We are going to start from a blank worksheet. Uh, most courses in financial modeling may, may give you a blank worksheet, show you a few steps, and then you have the historical, uh, the historical data that you can download. We're going to start from a blank sheet. We're going to do a number of steps uh, over the first two weeks. The first two weeks will be dedicated to building uh, the uh, model with all your historical uh, uh, data in place before we start projecting. I think it's important you go through that experiment. Of, of actually uh, putting the numbers in. There is, from the SEC, uh, a way to download an Excel sheet that has all of the data in it. I'm not going to uh, take that path. We're actually going to enter the numbers in by hand. The reason is because it brings you closer to the numbers because you're entering them in so you feel them you can you can see the the uh, the growth rate in dividends over time in revenues over time or the trend you can you can already start to feel it but if it's just dumped in there you 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 lose touch with it so i think we're going to uh, start from the blank worksheet and we're going to use historical data uh, i'm going to do two i had put uh, a posting on linkedin asking uh, you know a real estate REIT, a residential REIT, or uh, an automotive OEM, and that would have either been GM uh, or Tesla, uh, because they're easy to do. That's that's the thing you want. You don't want to start from a lot of complexity right away, because you'll get lost. You want to start from things that are easy to do, and over time build complexity. Uh, so we'll start with cap REIT. It's uh, it's REITs are easy to do, um, but uh, are very useful because there are so many REITs. If you can do uh, one REIT, you can do them all. And that's what's nice about it. And there's even private REITs. So if you go into uh, um, private assets or private equity, there are private REITs as well. This this works as well. Um, cap REIT is IFRS, not US GAAP. <clears throat> so we don't have a concept of depreciation when it comes to cap REIT. You have a con it is fair value. That brings in a challenge. So with fair value, we got to figure out, well, how are we going to model changes in fair value? And we'll see that uh, they are tied to the interest rate. So there's a duration component in there. That's going to make it interesting. This is going to be put in sector studies uh, in the real estate folder. And we're going to do Costco. Lots of talk today about Costco being significantly overvalued. 800 and some odd dollars a share. If you look at their last full year's earnings per share for the full year, you're at $14. You start figuring out, well, what is that? You're getting 60 times forward earnings. That can't be right for a retailer. 60 times forward earnings. And what is missing is that Costco, every couple of years, issues a big special dividend. You got to include that in. If you're just looking at the trailing 12 months, yeah, it looks ridiculously overvalued. But I think it's important uh, to look at Costco because here we have inventory. Uh, and with cap rate, there is no inventory. So we want to see how we deal with, uh, with inventory and the relationship of inventory with cost of goods sold. Uh, there are two revenue lines for Costco. There's merchandise sales, low margin business, and then there's um, memberships. So there's a couple of things that we can forecast in there. This will be in sector studies and consumer staples. Again, it's, uh, uh, it's not complex, but it'll, it, it introduces you to different asset items that are important to know because these are the drivers uh, of revenue. When I do this again next year, we'll move on to, I think we can do two companies at a time. We'll move on to two that are slightly more complex than this, but we really uh, want to get this down first without a lot of complexity, so we understand what we're doing, then we can introduce complexity. Um, if you're a CFA candidate, uh, just uh, um, CFA is really concerned about asset management and security analysts. Uh, those are the two real legs of CFA. Either you're going to be uh, uh, an asset manager or a security analyst. Lately, they've added uh, wealth manager, which 
I would discourage you from taking that pathway at level three. But if you combine the CFA with sector studies, portfolio construction, applied options, uh, that's the asset management pathway. If you combine CFA with sector studies and financial modeling, that's the security analyst pathway. CFA gives you uh, uh, the a good foundation in the concepts that you need, uh, but is always being criticized in lacking real-world application. Uh, this is all the real-world application down here, uh, which is why on our site uh, you can take the CFA subscription, which gives you all the videos and question banks and mock exams you need to help you pass the CFA exam, or you can take the CFA Plus. That's why the plus is in there, because it's plus this stuff uh, to uh, really give you both the conceptual side of things and the applied side of things. Okay, this uh, week one, September 9th, uh, we begin with both CapReit and Costco. So if you wanted to uh, grab the last 10 Ks of CapReit and Costco and just start reading, uh, there you go. Okay, let's start with the economic data from last week. Last Monday, the market opened down. Uh, I think we saw that coming Sunday night. And uh, VIX uh, was well in the 50s. Uh, and I said about selling options, but the market makers were having none of it on the um, underlines that I wanted to sell uh, puts on, and I wanted to sell them aggressively. The bid and ask were so wide apart that even after 10 minutes of being open, um, <clears throat> they were still wide apart and almost no volume. So uh, they just they just were unwilling to play along. Uh, and then uh, the VIX index started dropping. By the time it got to low 40s, there was liquidity. I was able to do some things, uh, so I did. And then once we got to 10 o'clock and we got the ISM, um, the market really recovered, uh, found some footing, found a, I guess you call it a, a bottom at that point, and volatility really started dropping. So you're trying to sell puts as fast as you can, but volatility is dropping. The, the, the big thing, it was the first 10 minutes was critical, and the market makers just were having none of it. So let's see what uh, what we had. We uh, got the S&P Global PMIs uh, before the ISM, and uh, eh, they, they were in expansion territory, uh, but they were lower than the previous month and uh, both lower than their estimates. Uh, but they don't get really paid attention to as much as the uh, ISMs. Uh, then 10 o'clock came, and look at this. Look at your ISM services, 51.4% expectation of 51 previous reading was 48.8 that's a big jump up uh the business activity 49.6 to 54.5 services employment after friday's bad job report 46.1 to 51.1 that's expansionary territory this is contractionary territory right the expectation was for 46.5 for it to increase a bit and boy did it increase new orders 47.3 to 52.4 Expectation was 49.8. This is a little bit negative. <clears throat> Services uh, prices 56.3 to 57. I want you to remember this. This is for July because we have CPI coming up this week. Uh, we also have some information um, from Manaheim <clears throat> about uh, used car prices over the month of July. 56.3 to 57. Uh, it was expected to moderate to 55.8. So this was all good except maybe this thing over here right and just keep this in mind because we're going to add it to some more data um this helped <clears throat> but uh s p around 530 to 532 533 seems to be about a limit uh, it gets there and it's it it starts to fail uh, so i don't know if it's uh, if the market has the willingness uh, to bring it higher in front of CPI, in front of Jackson Hole, uh, in front of September, <clears throat> the, the Fed meeting. We'll look at uh, uh, Michelle Bowman's speech from Saturday where she quite clearly uh, is not uh, on the side of the market on this one, is saying, I don't see evidence yet that we can cut. Never mind saying, oh, it'll only be 25, 50 is crazy. I don't see evidence that we can cut. And she lays out her case. Um, <clears throat> let's have a look. And that came out Saturday, so we'll we'll only see the effect. If it has an effect, we'll only see the effect when the futures open on Globex at uh, 6 p.m. 
6 p.m. New York time. Balance of trade, <clears throat> I think more attention will start to be paid here uh, for Canada. This is uh, for June. Uh, we have, uh, let's see if I can get a pen that works here. June, there we go. This is the X minus M component of GDP, C plus I plus G plus the trade deficit, right? Uh, 640, uh, 640 million, 0.64 billion. Uh, the expectation was for a deficit of 1.84 billion. The previous month was negative 1.61, which is a deficit, but a lower deficit than expected here is now a surplus. <clears throat> that is the country getting richer, which is what you want to see. That's the country. That's money from outside coming in. That is a boost to GDP uh, for Canada for June. <clears throat> Breaks it down into exports and imports. You can see the level uh, of each. And we're going to break down the U.S. here in a little bit more detail. Balance of trade for June uh, was a deficit. It's been a deficit for decades, really. Uh, this was uh, upgraded to negative 75. The expectation was negative 72. Came in a little bit, a little bit heavier, negative 73.1. <clears throat> the U.S. trade deficit runs about 950 billion a year. Uh, exports are about three trillion. Imports are about four trillion. So there's a lot of activity going on below the surface. Same with jobs numbers. When we say 114,000 jobs uh, were created. Um, under the surface, you have something like uh, 5.6 million uh, uh, exits, and you have maybe 5.7 million jobs, uh, uh, new hires. So it's not just 114,000 people got a job. It's, it added, the economy added 114,000 incremental jobs, but lots of churn under the surface. Here you have a trade deficit of 73, but <clears throat> it's made up of exports and imports. Exports per year out of the U.S. is about a $3 trillion business. Imports, $4 trillion. The exports are made up of about 66% goods, 34% uh, services. Imports, primarily goods, 80% goods, 20% services. And these services, 50% of it, uh, comes from travel, financial services, and IP. Uh, travel is... Uh, you're a U.S. citizen and you take a vacation in Europe or in China. Uh, that is an import. You're importing that experience because you're sitting in the U.S. saying, I have the experience of being in Europe. Um, well, you didn't buy that experience in the U.S. So when you go travel abroad, that's an import to the U.S. So uh, that's a, a big part of 50% of the services just come from these three, uh, these three sectors. The goods that are imported uh, are of primarily two types, uh, either cheap goods or low-value-added services on the goods. So assembly. Assembly can be done in China. You can send all your components to China. You assemble a consumer electronic product and you send it to the U.S. Assembly, you need cheap labor for that. <clears throat> or you need cheap goods, the kind of stuff you find on Walmart shelves. Right now, just so that we can put China in perspective, the trade deficit per year from China is about 275 billion a year of the 950 billion. And to put things in perspective for exports and imports, the U.S. exports out of this three trillion dollars, um, 4.3 percent of it goes to China. 22 percent of it is North America, which makes sense. That's Canada uh, and Mexico. Well, it makes sense because there's a free trade agreement. In North America so that is what we would expect to see is that kind of level so <clears throat> exports 22% imports 22.6 this is almost balanced trade so North America is not really a problem exporting to China well that's good importing from China they're saying well that's bad okay that's bad okay 10% um, of the uh, 4.1 trillion per year so basically 400 billion uh, is coming in from China. Uh, 400 billion out of 4.1 4. Uh, 4 trillion. And uh, this is a big, big piece of conversation. Uh, this, this is, uh, as I've given an analogy before, like me stopping work to do my own, to cut my own lawn, right? If I'm a country, I have a certain GDP, which is my income. <clears throat> And then I import services like cutting my lawn. It cost me 40 bucks to have the kid cut my lawn. It would cost me more than 40 bucks 
through lost opportunity if I did it myself. That's why you import it because it allows my domestic income, my household income to be higher by getting rid of these low value, low cost uh, uh, services that it's cheaper really uh, for me to pay other people to do than to do it myself. This is what's going on over here. 80% uh, goods, these are, like I say, the cheap stuff that's coming in, right? So the idea that Trump is going to put all these tariffs on China, well, what, what, what's it gonna come to? You got roughly coming in 400 billion, but you're exporting 4.3% of your, your three trillion, uh, roughly about 120, 125 billion to China, don't you think they're going to have something to say about that? Right? You're risking that. And really, the trade deficit's only $275 billion. <clears throat> If you try to get rid of that trade deficit, it might actually cost your domestic production $500 billion to replace what $275 did, which means you'd actually lower your GDP by not importing. I don't know that they fully understand that. I think maybe they have in their head China bad. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's it's a fool's game to try to, to throw tariffs on that. I don't think they're going to do it. And even if they did do it, being that it's only 400 billion of the 4.1 trillion per year, that cannot be as inflationary as everyone says it's going to be. It's a small group of products. And okay, so we don't import as much, or I say we, the U.S. doesn't import as much cheap stuff from China as it does. That cheap stuff you find on Walmart shelf. So what? Is that so bad? Would, would any American company step up and, and replace those, those cheap little things? Probably not. So we don't buy the cheap stuff. Can't be that bad. Moving to Tuesday. Total household debt for Q2. Uh, total household debt, $17.8 trillion, up from $17.7 trillion. Uh, the uh, increase in... Consumer credit, we got that a little later in the week, uh, came in lower than expected. So you have this increase in consumer credit that's doing this now. It's starting to top off like that, sort of in a slowdown phase. Uh, could it be that uh, consumers are relying less on credit, saying, oh, we don't like credit, we're paying down our debt, it's slowing down, or that they're pretty much tapped out everywhere they go and uh, there is no credit left to have. Uh, that's the worst of, of the two. Uh, Wednesday, used car prices, uh, month over month, uh, for, this is for July, and we're getting CPI on, uh, I believe it's Wednesday this week, for July. Now, I want you to remember the previous screen where uh, ISM services prices paid for July came in higher than expected, came in at 57. The uh, expectation was 55.8. The previous read was 56.3, came in higher for the services side. Used car prices month over month, 2.8%. This is month over month. That's not year over year, month over month. The previous month was negative 0.6, came in at 2.8. I don't know. You get CPI this week that's slightly hot, and we're going down. We're going down because that, that 50 basis point rate hike that has about a 50% probability for September even that 25 basis point rate hike with this Fed, as cautious as they are, that's off the table. We're going down. This, uh, the CPI report this week, I think is a huge risk event because you have evidence here, used car prices are ha have gone up. You have evidence from ISM services uh, prices that prices have gone up. And services is the bigger part of the economy. I don't know. You nervous as well? Uh, year over year for July, uh, last reading was negative 8.9, uh, which is quite a bit year over year. Now it's only 4.8 because of the uh, <clears throat> because of uh, July coming on up 2.8. Uh, crude oil uh, finally playing along here. You had a bigger drawdown than expected, and oil had a good week up 3.83 percent. And uh, how am I attributing it to that report? Here it is, right here. Here's the report. So you had oil for the week that uh, looked like it was uh, sort of range bound. The report came out and brought it to uh, new new ranges. That these two big bars in there, that is uh, when the report came out. It was a move of like a dollar thirty in the next two hours just on that report. 
up 3.83 percent week over week. Uh, gasoline stocks uh, had a had uh, a build 1.34. The expectation was for a drawdown of 1.8, but you had a build. But if oil prices are going up, it's going to drag gasoline prices up with it. But certainly underperforming uh, oil. Uh, Oxy was up 1.35 percent for the week. EPS of a dollar three beat by 26 cents. It was a good report, but it has some. Uh, some issues with debt, which it says it's going to take care of. We had a deal that kind of fell apart, and now Oxy has to pick up the slack and finance the whole thing. Uh, so in their uh, <clears throat> conference call, that's where their focus is going to be, is on debt reduction. Buffett currently owns 255 million shares, roughly about $15 billion uh, worth of Oxy. And I haven't heard anything about, uh, even though he's been selling, I haven't heard anything about any sales uh, from this one. So I'm comfortable with this one. I'm comfortable with their big fat cash flows. Uh, yeah, they got to pay down that debt, but uh, they have the cash flow to pay down the debt. It's not as if they can't. And the fact that they, just the very simple fact that they recognize that that's what they should do tells me the debt's not a problem. Debt is only a problem when those who are responsible for the debt don't recognize that it's a problem then that's what makes it become a problem when you don't recognize that it's a problem. Here they do. Okay, this deal didn't work out. Uh, we had somebody who was going to take some assets. Didn't work out. That's fine. That's fine. We'll take care of it. Good enough. Moving to Mexico. <clears throat> Inflation rate uh, for July, year over year, 5.57. Uh, right bang on the estimate, 5.57. Core inflation rate month over month, 0.32. That is up from 0.22. Uh, the inflation rate, the headline month over month, 1.05, up from 0.38. It is North American. Uh, is, this, is this potentially telling us something? Uh, we have two data points out of the U.S., the Manaheim Used Car Index and ISM Services uh, prices paid that don't look good in terms of what to expect for CPI. We have Mexican inflation, which, let's face it, that's a, that's a pretty big jump up from 0.38 to 1.05. The core 0.22 to 0.32. That's a 50 per, that came in 50 percent higher than the month before. This came in what almost triple uh, uh, what the month before was. So I don't know. I would be nervous on that on that CPI report. Continuing jobless claims, a little bit more good news uh, here for the uh, claims, 233. The expectation was for 240, so that was good. It came in below expectations, and the previous week was downgraded uh, down to 250 because uh, that did cause some concern last week. 250 still elevated, 233 still elevated. You know, you want to see 210, 205, 200, 233 uh, for jobless claims. Mexico interest rate decision, uh, even uh, even with seeing uh, the uh, new data, they went ahead and cut 10.75, not 11%. Currency uh, stabilized. Currency went from uh, being in the 19s to the 18 handle. We're 18.8 uh, right now. Uh, I think it continues to strengthen. I think the carry trade is back in play. Um, my my thinking on what happened in Japan is quite simple. Uh, they have a weak currency. They know they are a funding currency in a carry trade. They know that. There's no way around uh, around that truth. Uh, and they had a negative interest rate. So if they're going to be a funding currency, why not have a positive interest rate? Why not make everybody pay more for it? Not much more. You don't want you don't want to disrupt the whole world. But why the hell not make uh, the rest of the world pay for it. And if you uh, increase your overnight rate, all your short-term money market funds in Japan will reset to that rate. So if the carry trade is multiple times the amount uh, uh, that's being financed uh, at the short end of the curve, the globe is paying uh, 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 Japan's interest rate on its money market funds. The government is not paying it anymore. If you had negative 0.1 interest, uh, and you're using the currency for your funding trade, uh, you can't use an intermediary now, right? You either have to be a big bank that can access the funding market directly, or you're using the currency to get it done. 
uh, through a broker that allows you to 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 then invest uh, both uh, the uh, not not invest the yen but to to invest the target currency uh, or or to short directly uh, uh, some kind of security within within Japan and get that done by moving it just slightly here's the zero line by moving it from here just to here um, takes a lot of funding cost off the nation because rather than pay you are now getting paid you're getting paid to uh, to have that carry trade in place so I don't I don't think that uh, that any more rate hikes are probably uh, on the trajectory and I think one of the governors of the Bank of Japan pretty much said the same thing that that we, we were gonna hang out here my thinking is that I think it sounds like this was the plan all the time is to say well because why move only 15 basis points right if you're gonna move move but I think they uh, move just enough to bring that into positive territory saying if we're gonna be a funding currency fine we'll be a funding currency but you guys are gonna start paying us for it now so I think that gives a lot of support uh, for the peso the pair was down 1.56 percent week over week when we say it's down uh, that is the uh, the US uh, the US dollar uh, actually it's uh, uh, based on the quote uh, how we read this is one US dollar buys so much uh, uh, so many pesos this is not a CFA quote this is a market quote right so it's not as a fraction so that means when we say this is down that means the US is down and the peso is up uh, I will uh, continue with this. I did add to my position. It's bigger than I would like it to be. Uh, and I used, uh, I'll show you in new positions, I used short positions from the market to fund uh, the U.S., the short U.S. position for the long peso so that I have no negative carry on the U.S. because it's a big interest rate on the U.S. to pay. I wanted no negative carry, so I, I used some uh, short positions to create the uh, to create the dollars for that. Industrial production for Mexico year over year in June uh, was negative, uh, but uh, more short term, uh, uh, something that's more recent month over month here, up 0.4. The uh, expectation was for 0.3. It's down from the previous month to 0.7. Expected to drop to 0.3, came in at 0.4. That's a nice positive. Canada, uh, employment change, lost uh, jobs, 2.8 thousand jobs it doesn't sound like a lot look at the expectation was for a gain of 22.5 so that was a big miss that's on top of uh, last month which was a loss of jobs as well unemployment rate expectation 6.5 came in at 6.4 how do you uh, lose jobs and not change your unemployment rate look at the participation rate 65.3 dropping to 65 that's how you keep your unemployment rate the same as you just get people uh, to drop out of the labor force stop participating and our unemployment rate will start to look better average hourly wage is still over 5% 5.6 down to 5.2 though so that is a positive uh, in terms of uh, more rate cuts that uh, doesn't stop the Bank of Canada I think the Bank of Canada has two more two more uh, uh, cuts this year I felt since, since the beginning of the year that we would end the year 100 basis points lower. Uh, as the Bank of Canada keeps cutting, my motivation to keep holding Canadian dollars gets lower and lower because the what it pays uh, drops. <clears throat> because when you're holding cash, you're basically holding a floating rate. Well, as the uh, overnight rate gets cut, your floating rate gets cut. So it looks like by the end of the year, cash will pay 50 basis points less than now. Eh. I think there are more exciting things to be in in Canada. Enbridge has such a beautiful dividend, almost a dollar a share for a $50 stock. I, it, I think it's a beautiful dividend, 7%, 6.5%, 7% on a utility. That's a far more enticing to me to hold uh, than, uh, than cash. So I will start to get a little bit more uh, aggressive on what I put uh, the Canadian dollars in because cash is becoming less and less attractive with rate cuts. Um, this is interesting, right? Full-time uh, employment change up 61,000 part-time. Uh, this is full-time equivalent in part-time terms down 64,000. 
that's if you had to look for something positive in the jobs report, that's it right there. Sure, you lost 2.8 uh, 2 uh, thousand jobs, but uh, you know you're you're losing a bunch of part-time jobs, but gaining a bunch of full-time jobs. Full-time jobs pay more and have and have better benefits. So if you had to look for something positive, there it is. I don't know what to read into the drop in the participation rate. That's interesting. Why we have a dropping participation rate with the levels of immigration we have. You'd almost think that we'd have an increasing participation rate that immigrants coming in would be more likely to want to work than not want to work. It would seem to me, right? Anyways, there's the week that was. Let's look at the effect it had. Okay, for uh, rates and yields, all of them gave back. Not everything, not everything they earned, but uh, they certainly did give back. If we look from the two-year outwards, um, roughly on average about 15, 16 basis points on average. 17, 16, 18, 17, 14 on the 10-year, still under 4%. So that is still uh, supportive for ABR under 10, under 4% is uh, where they start to do really well. Um, all the way out to the seven year uh, rates and rates. These are rates. These are yields. Rates and yields are lower all the way out to the seven year than they were at the beginning of the year. Uh, curve inversion still going on, backed up a little bit from negative eight to negative 11. So we're going to have to wait for a positive slope for a little while. If we get an ugly CPI report, if it comes in hot, uh, you are going to get a massive uh, uh, um, uh, bear steepener uh, at that end of the curve um, you'll go back from negative 11 maybe back towards where we were at the beginning of the year uh, and that inversion will continue longer and the belief of a hard landing will will uh, become more and more louder I think uh, balance sheet runoff eh. Net uh, three three billion soma nothing ran off there nothing to see here money market funds money came out money going back in fifty two billion dollars uh, fifteen billion at retail thirty seven billion at institution all categories uh, increased as well next FOMC thirty eight days away probabilities have shifted uh, twenty five basis points uh, versus fifty almost even on uh, the probabilities. Uh, last week was 69% on the 50 after Bowman's speech on Saturday. Uh, maybe next week we'll see the 50 uh, be under 25%, under 20%. Uh, going out to December, uh, having th uh, more than three rate cuts is now 70, almost 76%, down from 93%, down to 76% for having more than three rate cuts. Uh, PPI we get in two days CPI in three days this is going to be big this is this is going to determine the direction of the market and I think the market will probably have trouble uh, with S&P uh, sitting at the 500 to 530 call it 535 range I think it'll it'll be trapped there for uh, uh, until we get that report we have some evidence now that prices uh, may actually be higher so if CPI shows a tick up, if it comes in above expectations, look out below. It's going to be blood in the streets and a red, red day. Retail sales we get in four days. That's not going to matter if CPI, if CPI sucks. It's just not going to matter. Uh, and if you're into the grains, the WASD report is on Monday. As far as Fed speak, Tuesday you have Bostic. Thursday uh, you have uh, two speakers. And Friday you have uh, one. You have Goolsby. Look at the reverse repo down to 312. Uh, negative, it's drop of 26, uh, 26 billion. And we hit the lowest level on August 7th at 286 billion. Uh, now that it's broken the low, may uh, continue on a little bit. TGA down 68 billion, reserves up 194 billion. So uh, we're looking at still under 30 months, 29.63 months of runoff at this rate uh, to hit 2.5 uh, trillion. The big thing we have going on this month, Jackson Hole uh, and Powell always gives a speech from Jackson Hole. I think that one will be important as well, but earnings, yes, hardly any earnings this week. 
this is your risk event right here. If I had to say, uh, you know, if you said, look, I only have five minutes to be in the market, it would be uh, here between 8.30 and 8.35. This is, this is it. This is, this is the big one. Uh, um, if, if this comes in hot, we are going down. Okay, real yields and inflation expectations both increased. Don't know what happened here. These should be green. Actually, you know what? When I say should be green, they really should be red. Uh, a rate increase should be red because that's a price decrease. I noticed that a little while back saying I'm doing this wrong, right? But I was doing the color coding for the change in yield, not necessarily the price. Should have been green. It's red. Maybe I'll switch it all to uh, red and green so that it is reflective of the price. Yields up is negative for price, right? Fed funds futures. Uh, week uh, for the uh, week ending. Q3 showing um, 37.5 basis point cut based on futures pricing. Q4 another 66 for 103 basis points this year versus 25 on the last SCP. In September, we get another summary of economic projections. So that is four rate cuts by the end of the year. I seem to think it's three or more. So I'm not going to say that this is wrong. It's not too aggressive. It's the FOMC just isn't there. So what we're doing when we say, okay, 100 basis points is that it's not because we've got a signal from the Fed they're going to do 100 basis points. It's that we're getting a signal from the markets that they'll have no choice. They will come to recognize that they have no choice. <clears throat> That's going to have to be a soft CPI report this week. In other words, showing CPI has come down uh, for this to be in play, for this to actually not change. That, that, that's the first thing that has to happen. Q1, another uh, 44, and Q2, another 31 for another 76. So for the next four quarters, 180, down from 210, uh, 180. Uh, I, I don't know that there's much to do on this one here, 103. Mm. I don't know what my play here would be if I were going to do Fed Fund Futures because I think it's at least at least three. Uh, um, I don't think that we're going to get just one or two. I think it's three. More than three would be, you know, uh, uh, a soft read on CPI and softer economic data. You get a hot read on CPI. Uh, you know, even, even so this is what makes markets so difficult to play is let's say that CPI comes in very hot. Would we expect almost no rate cuts this year? Or would the thinking be that while well, rates are going to stay at this level, you are going to kill the economy. We are going to have a hard landing. The rate cuts will come even faster now. You could make the case that, that no, now we're going to have six rate cuts because we're going we're gonna to crash hard by the end of the third quarter at this rate maybe the thinking is you know we're already slowing down significantly if cpi comes in hot and we expect rates to not be cut then maybe the hard landing starts to get priced in and priced into the curves so you can make the argument both ways so you know this is what makes the market so interesting is whose interpretation of the events will prove uh, to be correct TLT down 2.06%. I didn't think it was going to uh, keep its level last week. It just seemed to be too much too soon. SPX, uh, call it unchanged. Implied volatility still there, but dropping out. I did sell some calls on uh, TLT. Um, it, uh, it showed some strength early in the week. On Monday, it was showing strength, and I thought this, it, this is not, we're not ready uh, to to price in this many this many rate cuts just yet didn't make any sense so I sold the 102 calls for 164. I'll probably cover before the CPI because what I don't want to see is a really soft CPI and six rate cuts being priced in by the end of the year. I don't want to see that because then I'll I'll suffer on TLT. I think they're like 55 cents right now so I I, I did okay on them but uh, I'll wait and see. If we have a, a, a soft, soft markets on Monday, I might have a chance to get out of them at uh, you know anything under fifty cents. I'd probably close them. Okay, mortgage rates still continuing to come down. Six point four seven, twenty six basis points. 
Uh, 10-year Treasury over the same period of time did not change at all. 30-year drop 26, or spread is now back under 250 basis points, 248. Looking at uh, some uh, of the stocks uh, earnings this week, or not earnings, uh, price performance this week, this should be red. I don't know why uh, my spreadsheet is being difficult for me this week, and these should be red as well. This is... Uh, there must be a sell uh, a formula that's off because below zero, it's programmed that they just turn red. I must have, I must have hit a key somewhere that uh, messed up some cells because uh, it's the same way on on the real real yield. So I got some hunting and pecking to do to figure out what happened here. But you get what's going. Yeah, and this should be uh, this should be green. Wow, uh, something really did something went wrong here. Okay, well, I got work to do. Um, agency up 0.3, Annalee uh, uh, up 132, ABR up 157, that's nice. Uh, interest rate sensitive over here, IYR, uh, call it flat. XLU pulled back 0.82. Uh, housing all, all down, uh, and same with the housing ETFs, uh, the home, home builders, and the uh, home construction. Thursday, we get the uh, National Association of Home Builders Housing Market Index for August. Uh, the previous reading was 42. The expectation was 43. That's still in contraction. Uh, I don't see anything that would change that. Building permits for July on Friday we get, and housing starts for July. Looking at uh, OAS, uh, going in the right direction, it seems to me, that the spreads are widening, which at this point in the cycle, with all, uh, all the concern for equities, um, it, it's not unreasonable to expect credit spreads to widen out, and they are widening. Okay, for the uh, positions this week, TLT, as I said, $102 uh, dollar call, September 164 uh, <clears throat> I did this on uh, Monday. Uh, I still have them, but the position here is bolstered by Bowman's speech. We'll have a look at that after the screen. We'll just go through some paragraphs. This was given. <clears throat> this was given Saturday. She's a governor, so she's she votes. Uh, cap rate. I did sell 600 shares at 49.45. No, sorry, 49.48 and 49.50. 300 at each. Out of my TFSA and RSP, I still have 62,800 shares. <clears throat> it's just uh, in the TFSA and RSP, uh, I'm just lightening up. That's all. Um, I, I, I'm not leaving the trade. It's If I did have to sell 62,800 shares, you're not going to get that done in one day without moving the price significantly. You do have to bleed them out slowly over time. <clears throat> Uh, also, I sold puts and covered on semi, FCX, GM, SPY, Annalie, and Oxy. Uh, where the market maker would let me sell puts, I did uh, quite heavily. And then I covered by the end of the week. This was a pure Vega trade. <clears throat> um, I wasn't interested in having that quantity of shares put to me, so I wasn't willing to hold it any longer than just the drop in volatility. Volatility, whenever volatility spikes it never lasts long it comes right back down it's not as if volatility spikes and does this kind of thing and keeps trending this way it spikes now it could spike even higher right it could do that but when it spikes it usually comes down very fast <clears throat> so when you do see that uh, you have to take advantage of it while it's there where's the top that's the trick who knows you could get crushed if you don't pick if you if you're not if you go in heavy and you're nowhere near the top I went in heavy on these because I have the cash to back it up, and I could have survived. Uh, you know, if 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 volatility went from fifty five to eighty five, uh, it wouldn't have it wouldn't have uh, hurt me in the sense that I had to close positions, and then I still had room that I could have uh, done more. <clears throat> but market maker wasn't; it just wasn't letting people in. So I grabbed whatever I could, and then I closed them at the end of the week. <clears throat> I didn't do as well as I would have liked to, given where VIX was. But again, the market maker on almost all of them were being was being a prick. I re-entered my Tesla short. I am more and more convinced that this thing that there's nothing there. <clears throat> uh, as far as Elon Musk goes, as far as far as being a visionary and coming up with ideas and thoughts, <clears throat> hats off to him. He 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 has a, a talent for that. 
uh, but he's not he's not a CEO of uh, a maturing company uh, he is a startup uh, a startup person a dreamer a thinker <clears throat> but he needs he does need to go away at this point and uh, Tesla needs to bring in some serious management uh, so I have more conviction in this being a, sh a short. I've actually just sold shares this time because I want the cash. It's got a low borrow cost. It's 0.25%, which is low. And it gives me U.S. <clears throat> so with the U.S., it allows me to add to my uh, peso uh, long position, which is short U.S. long peso. So I get U.S. dollars here. I'm short US dollars here. If I'm only short US dollars, I'm paying the cash rate plus, I think, 125 basis points, almost 7% for that money. Well, now I'm only paying 25 basis points for that money because uh, I'm short US long uh, the peso. I have no negative carry on this one. And I think the yen carry trade is back in play. So that's the other thing is uh, more conviction on the long peso. Um, I don't think Tesla has anything when it comes to a robo taxi. If they did, they'd already have it. Their uh, sales in California are dropping significantly. That was their big market. Uh, people who vote Democrat, who lean left, are more likely to buy an EV than people who lean right. And he is, with his public endorsement of Trump, he's alienating uh, that group. And call it what you will, it's still a car company. Their cash flows come from the car company. So if they want to keep funding uh, AI and uh, the robot and, and full self-driving things that I just don't think, I think are, are, are not going to happen anywhere near the time frame, he says, they need the cash flow from the auto side. And that is uh, <clears throat> cratering very, very quickly. So I think it's more of a short than ever before. I covered my previous ES short. Uh, at a small profit, not a big profit, a small profit, but again, the ES short was an extension, right? So I have a number of long positions, but I'm nervous about the market. Uh, I'd like to extend these long positions, but that means more beta. So what you do is you combine it with a short beta to get positive beta over here. Uh, so it just allows you an extension so you, you can do better than just the core that you had. And as long as your positive beta is doing better than your negative beta, um, it doesn't cost you anything to get that. I did cover the previous ES short, plus I covered IWM and IJR. I was short small caps. <clears throat> they had fallen enough. I got out. I got out of IWM too soon. Same with IJR. I got out too soon, but I'm out. Uh, I've re-entered uh, the short market position, but this time uh, directly shorting SPY <clears throat> uh, because I can use the U.S. dollars. Uh, it is a low borrow cost. Again, shorting SPY only costs 25 basis points. It gives me U.S., so this is restricted cash. <clears throat> you need 130% of your short position, but you don't need to have it just sitting in cash. You put it in a T-bill. If you put it in a T-bill, uh, a 30-day T-bill, uh, for IB, it's the same as cash. You're allowed to do that with, with your the proceeds from your short sale. Uh, and this is paying 5.5% and my borrow is only 025 And I do have a, a sort of a negative bias on the market. What it also allows me to do is be more aggressive with stocks that have pulled back. Uh, because if, if the market does go up, it'll drag those uh, along with it. So I'm using the market as a, a source of funding uh, for US dollars right now. Uh, I will re-enter IWM on any significant rally. I'd need to see IWM two, two, above 215, you know, pushing 220, I think I'd start to, to re-enter that short position. Uh, I'd leave IJR alone this time, but IWM, I'd pick on that one. <clears throat> and I, I think uh, uh, with the CPI risk, coming up this week. If I see long positions I want on Monday and Tuesday, <clears throat> I am going to combine it with a short position in SPY so that it doesn't cost me anything. Um, <clears throat> we're getting near the end of, uh, of me presenting new, new positions in the market outlook. There's only two more weeks, so I thought I'd give you my conviction list, my long conviction list. Number one, number two, number three, Canadian residential REITs. Uh, with a cap rate being my number one conviction in my number one conviction space. I have other residential REITs. I have Minto, Interrent, and Killam. <clears throat> so I have, I have four of them. 
I've been looking at Northview. They've uh, reintroduced a, a, um, a publicly traded a high yield, kind of a high yield apartment fund. <clears throat> Incredible growth on, on their net operating income, uh, holding a nice market price. I'm just, I, I feel I'm missing something in that. There's, there's something I'm missing and I'm not quite sure what it is, but I'm not comfortable with it yet. Number two position, U.S. Utilities, <clears throat> uh, exposure through XLU, and I like NEE of all the uh, utilities. Why am I picking on Florida? <clears throat> uh, if you look at a map of, of the U.S., and I'll just draw one out here, uh, kind of like uh, as best I can, you know, whatever it looks like. Uh, and if you look at where, um, the if you look at... Uh, I'm trying to find the word migration within the U.S. Just within the U.S., um, orange dots are where uh, population is decreasing. Uh, I'll put these dots up here uh, and uh, up around Seattle, Portland area, and uh, the green dots are where the population is going. You have uh, I know I didn't draw this right, Texas, and here. Uh, those are the biggest losers and the biggest gainers. Uh, NEE owns half of Florida. Duke owns the other half. Uh, so, uh, and NEE is the largest component of XLU. So, <clears throat> I've got exposure to both of these, uh, and I think I would hunt around for some of the other utilities and probably add more. That would be my second high conviction. When I say conviction, I'm talking five, ten years. If I had to go away for five or ten years, what would I be comfortable in? Number three is copper, uh, COPEX. This is a, an ETF of a lot of copper miners. HG is copper itself, uh, which is a uh, futures contract. I can see selling puts uh, on copper on a rolling three-month basis and uh, FCX. I am long FCX. <clears throat> I should talk about this. Uh, I did have shares put to me. I am long FCX, <clears throat> and I'm going to be adding to that FCX position. I'm going to allow the other ones to be put to me. If they are put to me, I'm going to take them, uh, which sets up an allocation factory for me. And just to explain briefly what that means, let's say that I want, to, and I'm just going to erase something on the screen. You don't need this up here anymore. Let me just take that out of the way. So let's say I want a core position just for argument's sake of 2,500 shares. I'm just making round numbers to make the example. And let's say 5,000 get put to me. If I have 2,500, I'm going to be selling 10 Delta calls, uh, really out of the money, but I'm going to sell the 10 Delta calls because uh, <clears throat> it requires no margin to do this. It's free money, uh, and I'd be manufacturing a dividend every single month. If I have 5,000, what I will do is I'll sell 10 Delta calls on uh, 25 of them, and I'll sell something like 40 Delta calls on the other 25 because I don't mind them being called away uh, because it's more than the core position that I want. Uh, and if they're called away, uh, keep in mind, I'm still selling puts in behind there. If I have 5,000, I'll move my put selling to point 0.1, my call to point 0.4. If they're called away and I only have 25, I'll move my put selling back up to point 0.3 and my call selling to point 0.1. You just adjust your calls and your puts uh, to, to try to keep a target allocation. But you don't mind going above your target allocation. Uh, that is COPEX. You can manufacture a beautiful dividend, uh, a significant dividend you know, upwards of 15, 20% on a dividend yield by doing that. So uh, being that I'm, I've am i got conviction in the, in the company, conviction in the space, it's perfect to do that on, so I will be doing that. Um, <clears throat> number four is duration. You would think that would be my highest conviction. Conviction is five to 10 years. Uh, if your conviction is uh, one to two years, something can happen in the next one to two years, it's not really a high conviction. You don't want to go away for five or ten years so you could say that's my high conviction short-term list right duration u.s treasuries and tlt of which i have uh i think this will pay very well over the next 12 to 24 months <clears throat> gm uh, when gm dropped below 39 i was selling puts heavy <clears throat> because uh, um, uh, it is massively undervalued that's 3.9 times forward earnings this is a cash generator uh, at this point uh, and under 40, it's just going to make them buy back more shares. Uh, and if they are going to buy back, they're reporting again in October. It was last uh, <clears throat> last October that they uh, uh, 
did a ten million dollar, a ten billion dollar accelerated uh, share buyback. I don't know if they do another ten. They did ten. They did six earlier this year. I I can see them throwing another five, six, seven billion on that uh, in in the quarter coming up. They will keep buying back shares until the market respects their uh, respects them and gives them a decent enough valuation. You know, even now they're sitting at 4.3 times forward earnings. If uh, they had uh, more average, uh, average uh, multiple, if, even if they had a like a Ford multiple, Ford is doing far worse profit profitability wise, but seems to want to trade at a higher multiple. But I seem to think that it should have at least a, a seven to eight times forward multiple, which would make it a seventy to eighty dollar stock, not a forty three dollar stock. But here we are. I think management knows that. Uh, and they will buy back shares until they get the valuation they want. So GM uh, is, is on that list. Uh, but these are my big three uh, that I will uh, keep playing with and play around with, right? Just because uh, you, you own uh, some of this stuff doesn't mean you don't, you don't sell uh, some out-of-the-money calls. Even if it only generates $0.12 cents a month, <clears throat> that's an extra dividend. That's an extra dollar forty-four a year uh, from manufacturing the dividend of, on top of a dividend you're already getting, and and you work both sides of that trade. You work the calls, you work the puts, you get the dividend. Uh, you can do quite well. I can I can do without much work on a good on a good underlying. I can do about twenty percent a year without much work, uh, and that's without the underlying moving a lot, right? So there we are. Let's have a look at uh, Governor Bowman's speech from August 10th. Uh, we don't have to read all of it. We can skip a, a few things here. Uh, after seeing considerable progress last year, we have seen some further progress on lowering inflation in recent months. We go right to the last sentence. But inflation is still uncomfortably above the committee's 2% goal. Um, Despite the recent good data reports, core PCE inflation averaged an annualized 3.4% over the first half of the year. Given that supply constraints have now largely normalized, I am not confident that inflation will decline in the same way as in the second half of the year. <clears throat> That's a big statement. I am not confident that it's going to decline, uh, at least the way it did in the first half. More importantly, prices continue to be much higher than before the pandemic, which continues to weigh on consumer sentiment. Inflation has hit lower income households hardest since food, energy and housing uh, prices increases far outpaced overall inflation. Economic activity moderated in the first half of this year. Uh, and it just talks about uh, it, uh, it being a little bit lower, but notes that consumer spending uh, strengthened in the second quarter. Although consumer spending strengthened in the second quarter, consumers appear to be pulling back on discretionary items and expenses that ev as evidenced in part by decline in restaurant spending since late last year. <clears throat> Something that the quarterly earnings from Lamb Weston can, uh, can attest to. Uh, labor market continues to loosen. The number of available workers has increased. The number of available jobs has declined. Uh, last sentence, given trend productivity, wage gains are still above the pace consistent with our inflation goal. Baseline outlook, inflation will uh, decline further with the, current stance of with the current stance of monetary policy. Should the incoming data continue to show that inflation is moving sub sub su sustainably uh, towards our 2% goal, it will become appropriate to gradually lower the federal funds rate to prevent monetary policy from becoming overly restrictive. We need to be patient and avoid undermining continued progress on lowering inflation by overreaching to any, or sorry, overreacting to any single data point. Instead, we must view the data in their totality as the risks to the committee's employment and price stability mandates continue to move into better balance. That said, I still see some upside risks to inflation. So this does not sound like somebody who is ready right now to say, oh yes, 25 basis point cut. <clears throat> it certainly doesn't sound like somebody who's saying 50, we need to go 50. It sounds like somebody who says, I don't know, I don't know, maybe we'll stay right where we are. 
Much of the progress on inflation last year was due to supply-side improvements, including easing of supply chain constraints, increases in the number of available workers, due both to increased labor force participation, strong immigration, and lower energy prices. Unlikely that further improvements along this margin will continue to lower inflation going forward. As supply chains have largely normalized, labor force participation rate has leveled off in recent months below pre-pandemic levels, and significant significantly higher U.S. immigration over the past few years may decrease <clears throat> going forward. Geopolitical developments could also pose upside risks to inflation, as the recent surge in container shipping costs originating in Asia suggest that global supply chains remain susceptible to disruptions, which could put upward pressure on food, energy, and commodity prices. Also, the risk that additional fiscal stimulus could add momentum to demand. Impen impeding further progress on reducing inflation. A little nod here to uh, the um, amount of spending coming out of Washington. Finally, there continues to be a risk that increased immigration could lead to persistently ho high housing uh, services inflation. Given the current low inventory of affordable home housing, the inflow of new immigrants to some geographic areas could result in upward pressure on rents as additional housing supply make time to materialize. <clears throat> Talks about, uh, in this paragraph here, uh, evidence that the job uh, job numbers may not be as strong as they're reported. Uh, risk of the labor market has not been as strong as the payroll data have been indicating, but it also appears that the recent rise in unemployment may be uh, exaggerating the degree of cooling in labor markets. So sort of on both sides, okay, maybe the job gains are overstated, but the job losses, I think, are overstated, she's saying. The Q4 quarterly census of employment and wages, this is something um, that I, I, I've never really brought up. I don't really talk about because it's so backwards looking. Um, this month, we get another report for Q1. That's how backwards looking it is. We're in August. And we get a look at it for Q1. Uh, this survey here is is sort of like, you know, the the most objective number you're going to get because it's from the Census Bureau that uh, the companies must report certain numbers to the Census Bureau, and and those are jobs. They must report these things. Whereas with the uh, employment report, they're surveys, <clears throat> so not everybody has to answer it, but everyone must report this. So you get the actual numbers. Uh, and for Q4, it was showing uh, that the uh, jobs report each month has been overstating the number of job gains <clears throat> uh, based on, on this report. We get another one for August. But again, it's for Q1. It's for the end of March. And we're all the way in August. So we really can't use it as an indicator of much because it's so backwards looking. That's why I haven't really brought it up before because when something is looking back six months, well, that's, you know, it's six months ago. The Q4 uh, um, report implies that job gains have been consistently overstated in the establishment survey since March of last year, while the household survey unemployed data has become less accurate as response rates have appreciably declined since the pandemic. <clears throat> we know that the uh, uh, for the applied level, I did the um, a video on the jobs report. The household survey is a much smaller survey than the establishment survey, which is why we always defer to the establishment survey for jobs for jobs that were created. Uh, rise in unemployment rate this year largely reflects weaker hiring as job searchers entering the labor force are taking longer to find a job. Layoffs remain low. Likely that some temporary factors contributed to the soft July employment report. The rise in the unemployment rate in July was centered in workers experiencing a temporary layoff who are more likely to be rehired in coming months, and Hurricane Barrel likely contributed to weaker job gains as the number of workers not working due to bad weather increased significantly last month. <clears throat> so if that is the case, because we get another jobs report before the Fed, we get it in September, <clears throat> if, if, if Bowman is on the right path here saying, look, those big cuts in inflation that we had earlier this year, the the catalysts for them have largely worn themselves out. If you get a inline or slightly hot read on CPI and a strong jobs report in, in September, 
uh, rate cut could be off the table uh, for September and TLT is going to be in danger of revisiting the low 90s again and uh, perhaps the equity market might break 5,000 the longer the longer we stay here uh, at this point uh, in light of upside risks uh, uh, to inflation and uncertainty regarding labor market conditions and the economic outlook, I will continue to watch the data closely as I assess the appropriate path of monetary policy. Uh, I will remain cautious in my approach to considering adjustments to the current stance of policy. It is important to note that monetary policy is not on a preset course. Uh, in my view, we should consider a range of possible scenarios that could unfold when assessing how the FOMC's monetary policy decisions may evolve. Uh, let's jump down here. By the time of our September meeting, we will have seen a range of additional economic data and information, including one employment and two inflation reports. We will also have a wider view of how developments in broader financial conditions might influence the economic outlook. And in particular, equity prices have been volatile recently, but are still higher than at the end of last year. They're not. They're not watching the equity markets. I said that last week. They're not paying attention to this. Uh, and, and they're not going to come out uh, with an intermeeting, I said this last week, they're not going to come out with an intermeeting rate cut just because equity markets are down, what are they, 6% from an all-time high? They're not, they're not doing that. that. That's not this, this Fed. No way. I will continue to monitor uh, uh, the data and visit with a broad range of contacts as I assess economic conditions and the appropriateness of our monetary policy stance. As I noted earlier, I continue to view inflation as somewhat elevated. And with some upside risks to inflation, I still see the need to pay close attention to the price stability side of our mandate while watching for risks of a material weakening in the labor market. My view continues to be that restoring price stability is essential for achieving maximum employment over the longer run and then goes into uh, bank regulation supervision. This does not sound like somebody uh, who is seeing a need uh, for a 50 basis point rate cut in September. S&P forward four quarter operating earnings 258.77 from LSEG down from 259.51 and 257.58 from S&P Global down from 258.04 with the closing uh, SPX, we are at 20.7 times forward earnings. Um, still elevated, still still on the high side, even after our uh, our pullback to these levels here. We're still on the high side, uh, 20.66 last week. Surprise factor, 4.5. Uh, we have uh, some earnings this week. LSEG says 9, Sector Spider says 9. They both agree. Yay, uh, SP Global is at six, so uh, we're not too happy uh, with SP Global. The big ones to pay attention to, Tuesday, Home Depot, Wednesday, Cisco. Thursday, we have Walmart and Ross Stores. You'll have Deer and Applied Materials. Cat did well. Let's see if Deer follows suit. Implied volatility has come, uh, come down, but if you uh, draw out a line, there's only uh, a few points where implied volatility was higher than where it is. So even though it's dropped, it's still, it's still near the upper part of its range on a percentile, on a percentile basis. I think the only, and I've said it before, I'll say it again, the only risk uh, to the market this week, the big one, is going to be CPI. There aren't enough earnings to move the market. Uh, it's going to be CPI and then whatever external events happen that typically happen. But I think everything comes down to this report. So be safe out there.